electronics to motor vehicles, Japanese industrial products are renowned for their high performance. And they wouldn't be possible without the small factories that make the parts. About 90% of all factories in Japan today have fewer than 30 employees. Small factories are treasure troves of technical know-how. A single steel bar is all a machinist needs to shape parts for a rocket. Other experts use their sense of touch to machine metal to within hundredths of a millimetre and make parts that allow bullet trains to zip along the rails. A joint venture between several small factories is developing an underwater survey device that can dive to 8,000 metres. On this edition of Begin Japanology, our theme is small factories. By exploring them, we'll gain insights into Japanese manufacturing expertise. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. I'm in Ota Ward on Tokyo's south side, which has one of the largest concentrations of what on this program we're going to be calling small factories. Now, there's no formal definition of a small factory, but generally speaking, they have less than 30 employees. The ones in this area actually are a lot smaller than that. Some have as few as 10 or less employees. Now, what are some of the characteristics of a small factory? Generally speaking, the people who work there from the president on down are going to be specialized industrial artisans and in the business of making parts. Let's start off the program today with a look at the sort of manufacturing skills that you'll find in small factories. Many of Japan's small factories, around half of them in fact, are in the metalworking business. Some boast exceptional manufacturing capabilities. First, let's look at some machining. This is Makoto Iwai, age 75. He's a veteran machinist with over 40 years in the trade. He can machine metal rods to within one hundredth of a millimeter. He has made all kinds of components for precision instruments. Iwai's skills are needed even for parts used in Japan's super high-tech bullet trains, specifically components used in dampers that suppress vibrations as the train rushes along at high speeds. Iwai takes a 10 mm thick metal pipe, shaves it down to 2.5 mm from the inside, and then carves in screw threading. Let's see a demonstration of Iwai's supreme skill. Machining a stainless steel bar 52.01 mm across down to exactly 50 mm. He must remove 2.01 mm of material but the lathe is only calibrated in 0.02 millimeter increments. The rest must be done by feel. He carves away the metal. Exactly 50 millimeters. I carve intuitively. When there is resistance, there's a buzzing sound. But once that resistance is gone, the sound is softer. Using finely honed senses to feel differences of one hundredth of a millimeter, these are the skills small factories contribute to the making of ever faster bullet trains. Next, let's look at metal being bent. This small factory fabricates all kinds of parts by bending thin sheets of metal. Its parts appear in all sorts of products, from light fixtures to high-tech devices. Masayuki Mitsuhashi is a 40-year veteran in this trade. He can bend sheet metal to shape within hundredths of a millimeter. First, he secures a metal sheet between a mold and a mandrel. Then a tool called a spoon comes into play. Holding the spoon under his arm, 
he leverages his body weight to bend the metal. This process of forming metal into desired shapes is called hand metal spinning. I use some of my body weight and move sideways. When I do that, the material deforms. If force is not applied evenly, the material can become wavy or damaged. But Mitsuhashi is able to quickly form sheet metal to complex three-dimensional shapes of even thickness. The technical craftsmanship of workers at small factories has become essential to Japan's high-tech industries. Here's one famous example. This is the nose cone of the H-2, a Japanese satellite launch system that was first put into operation in 1994. The nose cone is made of a special aluminium alloy that is too hard to machine. It had to be made using metal spinning. It's thanks to the incredible work done by the human hand that Japanese space exploration can proceed apace. Now, Japanese metal polishing techniques are equally superb. This small factory polishes objects with complex shapes, such as cups and spoons, to a beautiful mirror finish. The quality of its work is recognized worldwide, attracting orders both domestic and foreign. Here is Kazuo Kobayashi, the company president. He's 69 and has been in the polishing trade for 50 years. To polish metal, an abrasive is applied to the grinder, and then the metal surface is polished. Kobayashi is a master of giving metal a mirror-like sheen. In 2007, he worked with a major manufacturer to produce a portable music player with this kind of mirror finish. The device has an extremely thin stainless steel case, 0.5 millimeters. To prevent the heat generated by polishing from warping the metal, he must work slowly with just the right amount of pressure. He strips away just two thousandth of a millimeter from the stainless steel, leaving the surface looking like a mirror. You have to take pride in your work. You need to keep improving day by day, year after year. When someone tells me they love my work, it really makes my day. It's so gratifying. The astonishingly precise workmanship at Japan's small factories is built on years of experience and refinement of all five senses. These skills support Japan's manufacturing prowess. This factory, which specializes in what's called hand metal spinning, is one that you've just seen in the video. This is where the reality show part of the program starts, and this is going to happen under the watchful eye of Mr. Minoru Kitajima. Kitajima-san, what are we going to make today? We'll make a stainless steel dish. Here's one I made, so please try making one just like it. So I gather that this is what we start with, is it? First you put it here. Okay, Turn it on, and it starts spinning. You hold the tool like this, left hand here, right hand here. Easy to hold it like this. Use your body weight as you do this. Oh, already making contact with this thing here. <laughs> do it slowly, so that the surface will be nice and smooth. A little more pressure. Oh, it's hard. It's, it's quite hard. This. Maybe a bit too much. Mm, go easy there. OK, now use this tool here to make the edge curl. Okay. Ah, that's good. Ah, the underside is... Oh, yeah, it's not quite flat, is it? No. Well, that was a pretty interesting experience, I must say. This is the one that I made. 
This is the one that Mr. Kitajima made, and if you look at them closely, you'll see that his is much, much smoother. How long does it take to get the knack of that? To make something like this two weeks or a month tops. But something that's complex, at least 10 years. <laughs> well, Japan's factories may be small in scale, but the quality of the craftsmanship certainly isn't. And there are some times when you need to make something so precise that even a machine can't do it, and the artisan's skill then becomes indispensable. Let's go back into history now and see how some of those skills were developed. Japan's small factories first appeared in... Numerous munitions plants were built to produce weapons and ammunition. Small factories also shifted to support in the war effort. But many skilled workers were drafted into military service and the capabilities of the small factories suffered. Eventually the Second World War came to an end. Small factories left in ruins by the war had to start from scratch again. In spite of supply shortages, they geared up and began producing everyday products. Many Japanese car companies and electronics makers that are household names today started as small factories in that era. By the 1960s, Japan was growing more prosperous. Consumers began to clamor for TVs, refrigerators and other modern appliances. The age of mass production dawned and factories grew ever larger. They were underpinned by small factories supplying parts as subcontractors. The number of people working in these factories was soon more than double what it was in the years just after the war. Small factories everywhere struggled to obtain labour. They began recruiting rural junior high school graduates and train large numbers of them. But since the 1980s, the number of small factories has plunged. The rising yen caused large companies to shift production abroad. Small factory subcontractors bore the brunt of this change. In 1983, there were 900,000 small factories in Japan. Today, there are only half that. Local governments in areas where these factories are concentrated have started to offer a helping hand. Auto Ward in Tokyo has built factory apartment buildings offering cheap rent. This building is equipped with large lifts to move heavy equipment and communal conference rooms that can be used for business meetings. It not only provides the base of operations for small factories, it also helps them collaborate so that they can make new products themselves, independent of large corporations. These days, small factories are doing everything they can to keep going. I've come across town to Sumida Ward, another part of Tokyo that has many small factories. And the local authorities here are working with a number of them on collaborative projects. This is one of those factories and they make umbrellas in here. Let's go in and take a look. And this is the president of the company, Mr. Yasushi Hanada. Thank you very much for taking time to see us today. 
I thought that I'd wandered into a greengrocer's shop for a moment and these beautiful green umbrellas. There's this project in Sumida Ward called Monozukuri Collaboration. And making these umbrellas is a collaborative effort by the local government, a small factory, that's us, and a designer. See, it all began with this product proposal that we received. Oh, this is really pretty. It's nicely put together, isn't it? The moment I saw it, I thought, oh, I just have to make this. And uh, so we did. That's really interesting because you have this rounded edge here. It looks like the lettuce leaf. And you have it, um, the gradation. We tried so many different colours to make it look as close to lettuce as possible and came up with this. And I can see um, they're working on these things. There's a lot of hand sewing going on. It's obviously pretty labour intensive as well. There are hardly any workshops in Japan still doing this kind of work. There are so few artisans now, and it's hardly profitable. You know, I'm just so grateful for all their hard work. Thank you very much. In the past, most of the work that small factories did was subcontracted, but recently, as we just heard from Mr. Hanada, some of the factories are starting to create their own original products. Now let's meet a man who's using his factory's unique manufacturing capabilities to create something that's really pushing the envelope. Sumida Ward in Tokyo is home to a dense cluster of around 4,000 small factories. Among them, there is this very small factory with just six employees. The head of the factory is Masayuki Okano. He's an industry veteran with more than 60 years' experience in metalworking. In 2003, he developed a product that had been considered impossible, a hypodermic needle with a tip just 0.2 millimeters across. This is so slender, it can penetrate skin without causing pain, like a mosquito bite. It's thrilling to do something that nobody else can, because, well, nobody else can. Like climbing a mountain that no one else has climbed. That's the ultimate for a mountain climber. Simply being slender is not enough. The needles have to be slender at the tip, but wider at the base. Otherwise, the drug will not flow smoothly through the needle. Fabricating this shape is very challenging. Conventional hypodermics are made by drawing out metal piping long and thin. This means the tip and the base are the same width. Okano decided to use a metal press instead, which can form any shape. The technique itself is nothing new, but using it to achieve this degree of precision posed a new challenge. The material is a sheet of stainless steel five hundredths of a millimeter thick. It must be pressed to form individual rounded needles with hollow centers. The tricky part is that any gap in the seam, where the two ends of the rounded sheet meet, will cause leaking. And welding the seam is not an option, because the heat would warp the needle. Okano used a technique called deep drawing, in which the press is applied multiple times to bend and stretch the metal. It required trial and error to determine the structure and shape of the mold, the amount of pressure, and the right lubricant. It is very important to keep refining old techniques. So important. If you think about the theatre, for instance, you need to know the classics before you write a new piece. That's true of our trade as well. Without mastery of the low-tech, you can't have the high-tech. After two years using all his accumulated know-how to the fullest, Okano finally created his groundbreaking ultra-thin hypodermic needle. The seam is completely invisible and no liquid leaks out. Okano didn't stop there. He went on to perfect a needle two hundredths of a millimeter narrower than the previous one. It's just 0.18 millimeters across. Okano's factory makes precision parts that no one else can make, and it constantly receives requests from around the world, including from NASA. Here are a couple of those painless hypodermic needles. This one in the middle here is just 0.2 millimeters wide, 
and the one next to it even smaller, 0.18 millimetres. And we've got a regular hypodermic here just for the sake of comparison. This big building behind me here is one of Tokyo's major convention centers, and they've got a convention on right now of and for small factories. Let's take a look. And this is the Hokusai 3, a fully electric vehicle. You just plug it into the mains at home for eight hours, and it runs for 35 kilometers. Eleven small factories from Sumida Ward came together to put this thing on the road. One doing the body, one doing the interior, one doing the dashboard, etc., etc. And this is just part of a wave of new manufacturing initiatives, bringing together small factories, each with their own different specialities. In 2009, many small factories in Higashi, Osaka, worked together to launch a small satellite called Mido One. In the midst of a tough recession, it was built to be a beacon of hope. In the spirit of Mido One, four small factories in the Katsushika ward of Tokyo decided to tackle another ambitious project. Their goal was not outer space, but the bottom of the ocean. This is the deep sea survey device called Edoko One. Full scale development began in 2012. The objective is to make it capable of going 8,000 meters deep. The man who put out the call to create the Edoko One is Yukio Sugino, the president of a rubber products manufacturer with just four employees. They launched a satellite, which seemed an impossible dream. It showed us the fantastic things that small factories can do. We have technical capabilities that are just as good as those companies. So, why couldn't we do something great for the world? Why not go to the deep sea? Just seemed like an interesting idea, really. Sugino had developed rubber products for a number of industries, but the deep sea was a new frontier for him. He discussed the concept with various experts and came up with this. This glass sphere is able to withstand the pressure at a depth of 8,000 meters. And each one costs around 300,000 yen to make, a relatively small sum. With their limited development budget, it was ideal. Sugino spent a year developing a survey device that used these glass spheres. The Edoko one is made up of several of them, and they're designed to hold camera, lighting, and communications equipment. The spheres are housed in plastic covers. The legs have tubes attached that can suck up samples. The idea is to carry the Adoko One out to sea on a small boat, attach a sinker, and let the vessel fall into the sea. When it touches down on the sea floor, its video camera automatically starts recording, and mud and microbes are sucked up. After its survey is completed, the sinker is released and the Edoko One floats back to the surface. Sugino believes that to achieve this plan, total development costs will be about 20 million yen. Sugino attracted the interest of three other small factories, all small to medium-sized enterprises with 20 to 30 employees. Each possessed advanced technological know-how in its own field. This is Toshinori Sakurai, who heads an electronics maker that is handling the power system for the Edoko One. After positioning the cameras and lights, they're completely sealed in the glass spheres. Sakurai came up with a method of using a coil to transmit electricity through the glass. Through a process of experimentation, he's searching for the most efficient way to make current flow by adjusting the winding and thickness of the coil. It's a long way down to the spheres, and we want to transmit as much electricity as possible while making the charging device itself as small as possible. That is the most difficult part. If we can make it work well, it will be a big breakthrough. Sugino is in charge of a device to relay data underwater. 
Because the main equipment is housed in separate glass spheres, in order for them to operate in sync, signals must be sent between them wirelessly. But these radio signals are blocked by seawater. So Sugino worked with a university research team to come up with a solution. And he discovered that connecting the glass spheres with a certain type of material would enable radio signals to travel between them underwater. In October 2012, a prototype of the Edokko-1 was completed and tested off Enoshima, an island in Kanagawa. The plan was for it to descend to 55 meters and fill the seafloor, then float back up. It succeeded in taking footage, but the release of the sinker didn't work, and the Edokko-1 had to be hauled up by its emergency line. Today we had a failure, and that's very disappointing. We will analyze it exhaustively to find out what went wrong. We want to send the Edoko-1 down into the Japan Trench at 8,000 to 9,000 meters next summer. The Edoko-1 project is a fusion of technologies from several small factories. Their challenge continues. There's an often told adage about areas like this where you find large numbers of small factories. They say that if you take your blueprint, fold it into a paper aeroplane, give it a throw, come back in three days, you'll have your product to pick up and take away with you. It's an indication of just how many small factories there used to be and the extent of their technological prowess. In places like Britain, where I grew up, I think if you had small enterprises like this, they'd very quickly get bought out by large corporations. Unfortunately, small companies in Japan are now finding it increasingly more difficult to survive in the current economy here. And that's a great shame because with the flexibility that these small factories have on account of their size, plus their technological know-how, they've been an indispensable force in Japanese industry for a long time. I'll see you again next time. Next time on our talk series, Japanophiles, we meet the American architect Asby Brown, who is showing the world how Edo period Japan made great use of small living spaces and traditional ovens. <laughs>